And um, when Anya first came to me and discussed this expedition or the prospect of this expedition, it seemed to me like an almost impossible fantasy. And I'm completely amazed and impressed that it came to fruition, that you actually did it, um, that you met the various goals that you laid out at the beginning and even other goals that you hadn't laid out. Um, so we're really interested to hear what you, um, what you did. Thank you. Hi, everybody. As I said, almost everyone knows me, so it's like me Oh, and I'm sorry. I forgot to say thank you to the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia for providing this venue. Thank you. This is going to be really easy. If no one else shows up, it's going to be like really like laid back and cool. <laughs> you can do a lot of being uh, So I would like to start by thanking three people. Uh, and like, Lansbury, first of all, uh, but Professor Lansbury, none of this would happen, and she provided the fantastic, unbelievable support, and I'm like so, so grateful. And uh, of course, to the amazing Jordan Center, Fiona, thank you for having my back, and to my amazing husband, this, this guy, because he put up with all this time me being away, and it wasn't easy, and he was so supportive and willing to do it. Um, so, the Denver 2013 project, Siberia, pretty extreme place, pretty far away. Uh, I guess I will start by giving you a brief overview of what the dead road actually is, and uh, once you know that, you will know why we decided to pursue this expedition. Um, so, after the end of World War II, uh, Stalin came up with this idea of building what was to be called the Transporter Mainline, uh, a railroad that was uh, designed to be over 800 miles long, uh, connecting the two towns, Salihar on the Ob and Igarka on the Yenisei. The uh, road was supposed to, the railroad was supposed to be laid uh, above the Arctic Circle in extreme inhospitable conditions uh, on top of permafrost that that was only on the very top level in the spring. Um, and of course, the idea was to use slave labor to do that. The project started in 1949 and ended roughly in 1953. Uh, no one really knows how many people, how many slave laborers were sent up there to build the road. The estimates vary from 80,000 to 120,000, so this pen is rather big. Um, and they worked in the harshest, most horrific, imaginable conditions. Those were mainly former POWs who got into uh, the Nazi captivity during the war, and upon returning to the Soviet Union were considered traitors to Homeland because they managed to get themselves into uh, Nazi captivity, um, as well as uh, different uh, political prisoners, uh, including uh, large chunks of Ukrainians, and Greeks, which is pretty unusual because we don't usually think of Greeks as one of the nations that suffered under Stalinism. Um, so off they went to the north. They managed to build by 1953. This is just a picture before the full stuff starts. <laughs> they managed to build uh, by 1953 uh, under 700 miles out of those. 800 that were originally planned, and then upon Stalin's death, the project was immediately abandoned because there was really no need for that railroad above all. Um, the reasoning was that theoretically it could facilitate the transportation of nickel from Noryosk uh, and possibly also supply some uh, ports under uh, some harbors on the Arctic Sea, but uh, the Obandini Sea being used as the two major river. Uh, Routes for transportation uh, made the, the railroad completely obsolete. So the project was immediately abandoned, and upon it, uh, its abandonment, it turned out that it's way too expensive to try and evacuate not only people but also the equipment from uh, a site that's so far away. Uh, so the people were evacuated, but the whole Gulag camps were just abandoned the way they were, because usually they were dismantled and then you know, fragments were used somewhere else. In this case, it was just abandoned and people were drew. Uh, so this is what we can call the, uh, 
the uh, only standing open air museum of Stalinism. Uh, this is the only camp, chain of camps, that are completely preserved and really do look today the way they looked in 1953. Uh, mainly because you're just so far away that not even people who would normally dismantle them and use, let's say, the wood for fires can get there. It's just, it's just too, too, too far away. So these are a number of pictures of, that we've managed to collect uh, of the um, building of the railroad. And this is seen there about 2013. <laughs> At the airport in Warsaw, right before leaving, uh, from the left, Marek Kozakiewicz, our cinematographer, and the author of the brief clip that you will see later on, Tomek Przewodczewski, our boss, and we call expert, he's just, he's just the expert on pretty much anything you need to know in life. <laughs> just ask him, he'll know. He already knows. Uh, and the author of the overwhelming majority of the pictures that are in this slideshow, and myself, <laughs> the only female part to this trip, uh, Olga Zorlitsky, a historian and representative of our main sponsor, uh, which was Odkrywca magazine uh, from Poland, and Maciek Cyprych, a logistics expert, and my very dear friend from early childhood. Uh, we were really, really happy at this point because we were denied visas to Russia repeatedly, and <laughs> we did not know if we would be able to go. Finally, we picked up our visas already in that those outfits with backpacks three hours before our plane to Moscow was about to leave. So <laughs> that was that was pretty intense. And we were really proud because the expedition took place in 2013, which was the 60th anniversary of Stalin's death. So it added an additional uh, layer to what we were doing, to the fact that we were looking for uh, the last standing monument to Stalinism. And th these are the, the faraway lands where we went. The map is in Polish because my uh, abilities as a graphic designer defeated me to change the language into English, but nevertheless, the, the big thing is Russia. <laughs> we started by fly, flying to Krasnoyarsk, then we took a ship up the Yenisei to Tuluhansk, and the remaining part, getting from Tuluhansk to Yanovstan and then further on, uh, was really a big mystery at that point. Uh, there was only so far you can plan when it comes to going to Siberia doing it from your you know, cozy chair in America or in Europe. Uh, so we knew how to get to Tudorheinz, but that was still over almost 400 miles away from where we wanted to be. Uh, and we just hoped that things will work out once we get there. And yeah, this is exactly how far the distance from Moscow to Krasnoyarsk is pretty big. So total middle of Siberia. Krasnoyarsk is really ugly. It's a huge city, a million people, uh, with this weird mixture of big buildings and village-like conditions. Uh, it's when it comes to the big buildings, it's pretty much like East Bronx. So if you go to East Bronx, you go to to Krasnoyarsk, and yeah. And if you've uh, been to the Upper East Side, you know Krasnoyarsk prices. Just things are just insanely expensive. We did not expect at all. These are like really upscale New York places prices for like regular groceries. Uh, and of course, Lenin. Uh, the picture is taken from the bus, so, so it's not really like great, great quality, but people were, like, were really amused by the fact that we tried to take a picture of the statue of Lenin and we were surprised by how prominent and place it occupies in the middle of Krasnoyarsk. Uh, but the most, why we decided to uh, start in Krasnoyarsk is to meet with Alexei Andreevich Babi, who is uh, the head of the Krasnoyarsk chapter of the Memorial, Memorial Historical Educational Human Rights and Charitable Society, which is a fantastic organization that is trying to uh, not only monitor the human rights situation in Russia at the point, at the, at the current uh, moment, but above all, uh, they're trying to uh, preserve the memories of the victims of the totalitarianism. Uh, they are also being uh, repressed uh, quite spectacularly. Russia's foreign agent law, uh, pretty much any organization uh, of this type that has any 
links to uh, the West, most definitely to the United States, is considered to be a foreign agent. And they have a really, really hard life uh, conducting what you're doing, uh, to the point that in Krasnoyarsk we were staying uh, with Polish missionaries, we were staying in a church, and uh, when we tell the priest, the head priest there, that we are about to meet this guy from Memorial, he was like, not in this church. You, I, I, I totally support Memorial and what they're doing, but I do not want anyone to think that my church has anything to do with that organization, so you have to organize the meeting somewhere else. So that's how Memorial works. And um, uh, the Krasnes chapter had fantastic materials on, on the dead roads that we decided to uh, use in, in what we were doing. And this is the last picture before we were about to embark on the trip, uh, being really serious and really hardcore, very professional. Notebook, camera, maps, knife, measuring <laughs> tape, all the usual stuff that you need when you're going to Tsetsaige. At that point, when we talked to people in Krasnoyarsk, we got first glimpses of the life in Siberia, starting with Oh, morph is going to be so expensive. Make sure you bring all the food with you from now, from here. To we're on the bus and we meet, meet this random guy. We start talking to him, and he's like, you know, showing us the site and like this is, you know, here's a museum, you know, here's a park, and then he points to this road and says, oh, and you make a left here, and you go all the way straight, and that's Irkutsk. And we're like, Irkutsk. How, how far is that? Oh, like a thousand miles. Oh! <laughs> so that's like the way you think. <laughs> Fair enough. So, yes. Leaving Kosnias, boating a... Uh, marking on the boat, and going up the Yenisei 1,500 kilometers, 750 miles, to Turuhaisk. Three days... Uh, three days... Tonight on the Yeni Sea, the fifth largest river in the world. The picture is really, this is uh, the ship. We were able to take the picture of this ship like that because we missed it the first day when we were supposed to get on it. So we actually had a chance to take a picture <laughs> from the shore. So the ship looks nice. Was it comfortable? Uh, it has luxurious accommodations, but we could not them, so we were, uh, like if you've seen Titanic, like the bottom yeah. level, where like the Leonardo <laughs> DiCaprio's like, yeah, that's pretty much, that's pretty much where we were. <laughs> yeah. So the, the majesty of the Yenisei is really impossible to, to show, to depict in pictures. It's absolutely stunning. It's, it's huge. It's beautiful. Uh, and throughout our, uh, our trip up, up the river, we've uh, encountered multiple little villages. Some, and uh, for those villages, the arrival of a ship like ours is like a big event, especially that the ship can only go around from March until we actually took the very last uh, cruise that season. So and that was August, late August. So because then the river the river freezes and uh, there is no no communication. So for those people, all these little boats here are taking off the shore the minute they see us, because we're bringing supplies and mail and uh, all those things that they normally don't have access to. Because at this point there are no roads around there. So uh, they get their provisions very seriously, as you can tell. This is all the stuff that they just picked up. Uh, other villages are big enough to have an actual harbor. When, uh, and that's where all the people, that, this is where it goes another way around, and all the people who are on the ship can get off and buy something to eat. It's mainly just potatoes and pickles, but amazing. And as I said, little did we know that this idyllic frolicking was about to be brutally interrupted by the arrival of Roman number one, the Samson. <laughs> We made a friend on the ship. <laughs> <laughs> His name is Roman. He's, this, he's a descendant, which means that he's a paratrooper. And he was going back home after three years in the military. Uh, and he was very, very excited to meet us, mainly because uh, we still had some alcohol at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Roman invited himself to, to our cabin. Uh, 
it was absolutely legal to smoke there, but he was one of those guys that you don't say just don't smoke. Just yeah. We're trying to appease him, and he was trying to like arm wrestle all of the guys. Uh, some of them were still like struggling from muscle pain like, a week later, <laughs> and he took this, you know, meeting very very seriously uh, to the point that. Uh, well, I went to sleep way earlier, but they did not manage to finish all of our supplies of vodka that night. So Roma reappeared seven o'clock in the morning the next day, <laughs> just helped himself to whatever was left, and uh, and that was the last time we've, we've seen him. And um, there there is regular police presence on ships like that, but there is also Oma uh, that makes for that. Um, Everything goes according to plan, I guess. Oman is um, the equivalent of SWAT in America. These are uh, police forces, but uh, trained like anti-riot police. And those guys were on the cruise ship the entire time, just you know, strolling around, making sure that I don't know exactly that what, but <laughs> but they were there and they were like dead serious and did not talk to anyone. And it seemed also like they never slept. At all during this entire time, so I'm not I'm not really sure. But and then we needed the Tulu Heights. When we were telling people in Krasnoyarsk that we're going to Tulu Heights, they were still like, oh yeah, this is like a major major town up north. It's like 5,000 people. It's a major town. This is the name, by the way. Uh, but the Tulu Heights is also the world capital of experimental weaponry. <laughs> 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 Uh, the, the overall condition of the town was, was pretty uh, pretty scary, and that's also when uh, we've encountered uh, oh some interesting architectural compositions with the baby stroller on top of a shed. And that's also when we've encountered some not a matter to local legend. <laughs> we've seen this guy approaching really fast, and uh, we were. Fairly certain that he is about to hurt us a big time. Uh, and then Tomic, with his journalistic instinct, decided to take a picture of him. And the moment he took the picture, the flash went off. And that's what happened. <laughs> watching, keep watching. <laughs> At this point, we want to evacuate and run because he just totally fell. But Marek, the cinematographer, is like, no, this is an amazing moment I have to like have it on camera and we're like but if he's really about to head our way we will probably <laughs> die right now but Marek was totally not put off by the fact that Roman was approaching so fast um, and after a very very brief conversation the next thing we know Marek is getting into the bike together with Roman and driving away with the camera we've seen videos that he shot in that way and all that you get it's really shaky and all you can hear is Marek going, Roman, watch any pista you're coming like really fast. <laughs> you're coming really fast. Um, and uh, that's after the um, happy recovery because they disappeared for so long that we've started to uh, like seriously worry that uh, Marek might have been like and we've managed to track down uh, Roman's wife to ask if uh, she knows, as I said, a local legend, so everyone knows like, where he lived, to, to ask uh, maybe she knows where, where uh, Roman might have taken Marek. And his wife said, Roman? I haven't seen him in days. <laughs> <laughs> so in a town of 5,000 people, that's pretty, that's pretty uh, spectacular. Uh, this is the airport. Uh, and to the high school, we were trying to procure uh, tickets uh, to continue our um, journey. Uh, unfortunately, it turned out that the tickets uh, are either not available or they cost like ten thousand like, dollars. Uh, yes, <laughs> so we ended up just going to the local authorities and describing the situation. Suddenly, there was a postal helicopter that happened to be flying in our direction, and we were all. On the helicopter to, uh, to proceed, but that was to happen later on. For now, that helicopter could not pick us up from Turukhais. The helicopter was available to pick us up from Kharkova, which is a village. Uh, this is Kharkova, Turukhais, which is a village roughly 300 kilometers away. 
Um, how to get there? Well, a motorboat, the only option. Uh, and we've met a very lovely firefighter who helped us. And for like no money, we just paid for gas for the motorboats. Took us all the way to 300 miles to, uh, to 300 kilometers to Farkovo so that we can catch the plane. But also, when he was taking us there, uh, together with uh, his father, and he is, he is smoking while pouring gasoline from one tank to the other <laughs> in the middle of a major Siberian river of Turuhan, the, the river is called Turuhan. Uh, while they were transporting us to Farkovo, they started also to inspect uh, what we are actually bringing with us. And uh, we became a major laughing stock uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, Jewish. <laughs> what same person brings a woman to the taiga? <laughs> Why am I there? Why do they need me? It's crazy. I'm going to like attract all the bears in the area. And, like, it's just going to be a miserable failure. They should leave. Well, when they decided not to leave me, then uh, do we have any weapons? Well, no, but we have this amazing spray made in Alaska to deter bears. You can imagine, you know, a hardcore Russian hunter who sees a spray for bears <laughs> and is like, what? <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, we had those, those kind of conversations. It ended up with Ivan, the younger firefighter, being so terrified that we're going to die that uh, he was de absolutely determined to find us a local guide who will go with us and protect us from all the dangers of the taiga. I'm sorry, how long did it take the 300 kilometers you had to go on those little boats? Six hours. Six hours, not too long. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Farkovo. Of course, in the winter, this is not how we saw it when we arrived. Almost the end of the world. We arrived in a village of 300 people. 170 of them are children. Because Farkovo is one of the only schools in the area. So all the kids that are born and live in the Taiga in Chums and the traditional uh, teepee-like tents that the native populations establish, uh, all those people, at the, all those children at the beginning of school year are picked up by helicopters, transported to Farkovo. They spend their entire year going to school, and then for the summer, the helicopters take them back to the Taiga. You can imagine a child who was born in the Taiga never seen any other person except his parents and maybe some siblings. And then at the age of seven, this child is put on a helicopter, like that is crazy, and suddenly is in a village with 170 other children. This is like a big event. Uh, yes, Kovo, uh, not particularly well developed, but beautiful. <laughs> uh, we immediately were, uh, taken over by the head of the local administration, who set us up with a place to stay, stuff to eat, and he's going to find us a guide. Um, food, very interesting. Um, we could not refuse to eat this, um, <laughs> even though we probably wanted it at that point. These are, uh, this is dried fish, but the fish is dried, like the entire fish, including like intestines, everything, and this is how you eat it. Because the, the bones become so brittle that you just like eat the entire thing, including like, yeah. We were really hungry. This is all I can say. <laughs> this is all I can say. And the deal was that we're going to get on the helicopter, we're going to get a local guide, but first we have to attend. It was September 1st, first day of school all the kids arriving, an unbelievably fantastic event with the head of the administration, making sure that every single person in the entire village comes to school. Uh, this is a girl who just arrived, who was about to enter the first grade, and she's being carried around the entire room with a big bell that she rings to officially start. The, the school year, she was absolutely mortified. You could tell she was like absolutely mortified because her parents were not there because you know she was brought from from the taiga. So uh, and then came Dima. 
the, the one closer. <laughs> this is Dima. Dima is our guy. Very nice man. Speaking a very odd mixture of Selkup and Russian and completely toothless, leading to the situation that we had absolutely no idea what he was saying and he didn't really understand us either. Uh, but what the hell? We're going to spend three weeks together in the middle of the taiga. <laughs> and also, this is the point when our only guardian rights became <laughs> evident. We had maps. There were no maps of that part of Siberia at all. Uh, no Google Maps, no Bing Maps, or just no maps. And we had those maps. These are old Soviet military maps made in the 60s. And those men, all of them hunters, who spend their entire lives hiking the taiga back and forth hunting, they've never seen a map of that area before. And they were absolutely amazed, and everyone was coming to look at the maps, they were pointing out places that they've been, and they were really excited. Uh, and the deal was that once we're done with our expedition and we're dropping off Dima, we're going to leave the maps so that they can, they can have them. They can. Where did you get the maps? Uh, we, get them, we got them online. Uh, they are available online. We, we have to pay a small fee. You can download them. The thing is, though, that they are, uh, there is a, an error in them, on pr purposely introduced by the Soviets who were paranoid that, uh, I don't know, people would be able to locate a lake, God forbid. So, <laughs> so there is uh, a scaling error. Uh, but we had GPS too, so preparing the two we were able to, to navigate. But the distance is very, very precise. We're about to take off with Dima, the Polish flag, the flag of Lodz, which is the town in Poland where we all come from. Uh, and we were doing this with participation uh, with the authorities of the city of Lodz, so that's why the flag is traveling with us. Uh, we're here right now, and the helicopter is about to drop us off. Here, this is Yanovstan. Well, this is if you thought that the airport in Turuhansk was the people, this is this is the airport in Kharkov. <laughs> uh, and when the uh, when the helicopter arrives, all hell breaks loose. Everyone wants to get on it or off of it or get like some mail or like shit stuff. It's absolutely crazy, but we made it. Very exciting, Bukash really wanted to do like a Top Gun like thing at this point. <laughs> uh, and this is what it looks like from the air. It's it's massive. The tiger is massive. Um, and at this point, we still thought that we were in the tiger. We were informed later on that this is uh, the border between Taiga and Tundra, so it's not really classified as Taiga anymore. It's the, like the, we have the tree level. Um, it's absolutely beautiful but also not particularly hospitable. These are all marshes. You can't walk on any of this. So. And we are about to arrive at the actual end of the world, which is Yanostan, and the part from where we are about to take off and start our hike. This is, this is the entire population here. <laughs> Another Dima, Katya, and the cat, and that's it. They live there. They are, they are meteorologists. And uh, their entire job is to record the current state of weather and report it back to Turuhansk every 12 hours. And they don't do anything else. Every 12 hours, they contact by <coughs> telegraph the meteorological station in Turuhansk. And they also have some puppies. And old school, it used to be a kolkhoz, but uh, of course not anymore. Now there's few people live there. Uh, Beautiful, though. This is like the equipment. And this is their hospitality. We had our tents, we had all our equipment, we were able uh, and willing to set up a little camp at their place, but they would not hear about that at all. So this is their actual bedroom. <laughs> and this is all of us sleeping around the bed. Uh, and it was just so like natural to them that you know we are tired, we just arrived. They never have any guests there, so uh, they uh, and they actually just returned from Turkmenistan where they were evacuated because we were uh, 
following in the line of uh, wildfires, pretty major wildfires, uh, that we were about to find out how, how big they were. Uh, so at this point, we we're about to um, venture into the, the real Goa, the real camps. Uh, Goa, the word Goa stands for the main administration of corrective labor camps and labor settlements. So theoretically, it refers strictly to the administrate, administrative body that governed the, the camps, but it is commonly used to, to refer to the camps themselves. Um, officially, uh, the Goa existed between 1930 and 1960. In reality, started as early as 1918, right before the revolution, and some of them were functional. Uh, all the way until the administration of President Gorbachev. Uh, about 26 million people passed through the camps. Uh, what does it mean? At some point, 26 million people in the Soviet Union were touched by, by the Gulag. Uh, at the high point of this, considered that about 1,800,000 people were uh, in the Gulag in 1954. That's the peak year. We, of course, know. In terms of popular culture, Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago uh, is the main tool, uh, is, is the main uh, source of information and the kind of uh, source of presence of the Gulag in the uh, general um, mind. Uh, criminals, politicals, or sorts of different uh, prisoners, uh, Gulags were supposed to uh, help. Uh, modernize the Soviet Union and help the Soviet Union to industrialize. In fact, what their actual role in the economic development was is very hard to determine. They were particularly productive. So they were never this very productive. Uh, we don't know how many people died. But some of the major centers of Soviet industry uh, that are still functioning today were uh, built and created uh, by uh, Gulag prisoners. Um, what the, uh, what's the difference between these mentioned here and the dead road is that these actually created something. And the survivors of these camps, regardless of how they, how they feel about the, uh, the political system that put them in, this, in that place, they feel that they did contribute somehow to the development of the Soviet Union. Those who survived the dead road have a feeling that their extreme labor was absolutely for nothing. These are the main camp centers uh, throughout the Soviet Union, but this does not really, the next map really shows the, the scale of it. Because as I've said, these are only the main centers. So in our case, only one camp indicates Salafar, only one camp indicates Salafar, only one camp indicates Zarka, the two endpoints. Whereas in fact, multiple small camps were all around, the, all along the, the road. Oh, and this is the actual number of camps in the Soviet Union. It's absolutely unimaginable. I know that this map is not particularly uh, legible, but I just wanted to show you the enormity of what we're dealing with. And pretty much right after leaving Yanostan, we found we find the first, you know, first sign of the dead road, which is the abandoned uh, old train national. All these trains were transported there by the NEC or the OB, and uh, those trains never moved, not even once, because the railroad was never completed to the point where they could transport anything. So they were just abandoned there. Uh, and it, it, it's crazy. It's like the middle of you know, this pristine, beautiful forest. And what you see are those huge trains, including, as is possible to read of this one, a, tr a military train from America. It's, this one was from the US Army. Actually made in by WAB and Co in Wilmerding, Pennsylvania. They are still operating. They're still making trains. I was trying to contact them uh, and find out something. Uh, I mean, it's it's pretty it's rather clear that these trains ended up there as part of the land lease program with the United States. Whether the United States government was the aware of the fact that the trains that they're sending to the Soviet Union to help defeat Nazi Germany are actually ending up up there by the camps. That's not that's not clear. But um, and we started to see the power of nature. Um, 
as I've said, this is permafrost. The, the, the land everywhere is completely frozen. In the spring, the temperature rises a little bit. And this is when, this is why this project was so futile. This is when the, uh, the tracks start to warp and the bridges start to crack. So they would work really hard over the winter to build it. And then come spring, everything we just accomplished would sort of fall apart. Right. Sorry. Uh, yeah, the Royal Tracks made in uh, a factory named after Stalin. Um, they had their own electrical network. But right now, not functioning because you can uh, guess from <laughs> um, And bridges. Multiple bridges crossing rivers, big and small, uh, at various stages of deterioration. Some of them burned, some of them completely ruined. Uh, one of those bridges will play a major role later on. Uh, with, uh, because we had to cross them, and these are not small things. And the guys were like trying to be like really macho and like really cool about it. I was freaking out completely, and I was actually there were there were bridges that I crossed on all fours, there were bridges that I crossed while sobbing. So <laughs> different things were happening. Um, but we're still at this point just hiking along the uh, rail. Uh, Train tracks. Fun when the, the weather is beautiful. Less fun when the weather is not so beautiful. Um, an example of a bridge in not the particularly great condition, as you can tell. <laughs> and that's when you know, there, there is a river underneath it, so we have to cross it somehow. So we would build our own little bridges. Uh, we weren't really afraid of getting wet, but uh, Falling into a marsh up to your waist is okay if it's just you. It's less okay if you have a backpack that's like 40 pounds and that has all the food and everything you will need for the next days to come. So uh, we would build little uh, little bridges like that to cross marshes. Uh, this is also where cigarettes come into play. Uh, when we first met Dima, uh, his first question was, which pretty much means whether we have a proposition for the whole trip. Uh, we said, yeah, sure, we have like, you know, instant soups and stuff like that. As it turned out, like his idea of what it means to be prepared and our idea of what it means to be prepared were completely different. Uh, what mattered most to him was bread, flour to make bread if there is no bread, sugar, tea, and cigarettes. Uh, when we asked him if he smokes, he said, if there is a cigarette, I'll have one. <laughs> then it turns out that if there is a cigarette, he'll have a pack a day. <laughs> so we weren't really prepared for, for that kind of smoking. Uh, and as it turned out, uh, Dima had a tendency to get very uh, nervous when there were no cigarettes around. <laughs> so uh, very soon rations were introduced <laughs> to keep everyone appeased. Um, we were constantly wet. And setting up camps um, was fun, especially when it was snowing. Um, but here Dima came in really handy. He also had some fresh meat thanks to him, because he kept hunting. Uh, the first time we had uh, this, uh, as he called it, pizza, uh, just bird, uh, that was pretty exciting, because it was like new, and oh my god, we just, you know, killed an animal to have dinner that's, you know, hardcore, really hardcore. <laughs> the 11th day when that was happening, less exciting. <laughs> But uh, we all were taught how to, uh, well, not how to shoot, but how to uh, gut birds and prep them for, for grilling. Uh, we also, <laughs> yes, this is a porcini mushroom, OK? If, uh, I know that mushroom picking is not that popular in America, or I grew up in Eastern Europe. We all go mushroom picking all the time. Well, mushrooms in Poland are not that size, OK? A porcini mushroom is like this big. This is a Virginia mushroom Siberia style. So, <laughs> so I guess when you know Russians from the far north go to Europe mushroom picking, they must be really disappointed. Uh, 
Because <laughs> uh, this with a single mushroom, you can feed like a family of four. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, Maciek was the master, the master fisherman. So we were pretty happy. The puppies also come into play later on. And here we were, after all this hiking, approaching the ultimate goal. This is the picture, the satellite picture of the camps based on which this entire trip was organized. Uh, for an untrained eye, it's really hard to tell what you can see in this picture, but these are actually buildings. These are all buildings that are still standing because if you're very well trained and I'm not, you can see the shadows cast by the buildings and that's how you can tell that they're still moved. Um, and we knew that that camp was so far away and uh, our ultimate goal, we ended up visiting a number of camps, but this one was our ultimate goal. Uh, and we were like super excited about it. That we are about to see a real opener museum of Gulag standing as it was 60 years ago. And as we started to get closer, the signs of the wildfires became more and more apparent. You see here, these are the train tracks that are completely burned. Bridges that are completely burned. Yes, it only gets worse. We finally reached the camp. And it burned to the ground less than a month before we got there. It was standing completely untouched as of July 2013. Late August when we got there, not anymore. It was very devastating because uh, we were planning from the get-go to visit a number of camps, but this was the one that was furthest away, this was the one that was hardest to get to, and this was the one that we really had like high hopes for. Uh, well, unfortunately, not much was left. So, this was a very humbling experience. Some buildings were still standing, but uh, mm -hmm. It was a very humbling experience. It was very, very hard to deal with. By the way, these are all blueberry bushes that are like this big and great. You know, it's delicious. So um, at this point, you know, we were pretty sad. We didn't give up. We kept looking. We kept hiking further and further. And we were about to find. It was actually standing. And here is a very bizarre situation. When we managed to make it to another camp and it's standing and the buildings are preserved and we can take measurements, we can document it, shoot the documentary, we were so excited. Uh, and then there is Dima, our guide, whose attitude is like, this is just an amazing source of fire. <laughs> Let's make a huge bonfire and roast all those birds I just killed. And we are like, we are here to document this place. And he's like, why would I chop down a tree that's alive if I have this that's completely useless? And try wood. And it doesn't make sense to kill a tree if you have all those, just, you know, those buildings just ready. So at some point, <laughs> There was a moment when um, we are photographing and measuring, finding different objects, and <laughs> Diva yells from the other side of the camp, guys, did you take a picture of this one? Can I start chopping it down? <laughs> and we're like, please, just, just don't. And he kept doing that to the different tracks. Like we would like, or the bridges, and that was the most terrifying thing because we knew that we had to use the very same bridges to get back. Well, and he was just like removing nature parts to make a fire for the night, and I was like, just don't, just don't, <laughs> just don't. <laughs> um, so here we reached the, the uh, actual well, well preserved camp. Uh, when we hear the word camp, the first thing that comes to mind are the Nazi concentration camps. And if anyone had a chance to see those, and then see this. The, the the impression is so like unbelievably different because especially places like Auschwitz are so like a museum right now in the way that they are preserved. 
Whereas this is like raw living history, uh, the deteriorating, but but raw living mm -hmm. history. So we've managed to find all sorts of different buildings, some of them barracks where the prisoners uh, slept, and uh, some of them, this was a dining hall. Uh, you could tell by the little window, by the little windows here that were, where the food was served. Uh, this was a laundry. Um, what the, the, actually, the barrels were still filled with uh, it's birch ash that was used to clean uh, the clothing. Um, we found a bakery that was just strewn throughout the whole place where were little like, uh, forms to bake loaves of bread. Uh, this is actually pretty important because the fact that there was a functioning bakery, uh, by the size of it, it was pretty obvious that it wasn't the bakery that would, would just serve the administration, but that there was actually bake, bread baked for the prisoners. Uh, and that might suggest the importance of the project to Stalin, that he would care to, uh, in such a remote area to provide things that uh, for, for a bakery, yes, to preserve like the uh, ovens can be, like the, whatever is left of the ovens in uh, the bag outhouses. Um, actually, outhouses are the most fascinating places to dig through in uh, camps like these because this is where a lot of things were actually uh, accidentally dropped and never recovered. So uh, spending the time to actually like dig through all the soil there uh, is is pretty pretty fruitful in terms of what can be what can be found. Uh, these structures we weren't really sure what they were. Uh, there were two competing theories. One is that they, these were uh, fridge type structures. The other one is that, uh, the other one was that uh, they, these were used to uh, punish to keep prisoners that were being punished because you know these are like holes in the current floor, so you don't really want to sit there. Uh, even though Tomek immediately got into one of those, it then took some time to get him out. <laughs> he thought that he's about to like make some major discovery. He discovered dozens of dead rats. <laughs> That's it. So I wouldn't recommend. But the buildings really don't tell uh, the whole story. Uh, and the, the whole the, the moment gets really powerful is when you start finding objects that were used by the prisoners. Uh, everything from spoons, bowls, mugs, uh, to shoes. This is actually a woman's shoe. Uh, I, it's, I know it's pretty hard to tell, but it is a woman's shoe, uh, which uh, suggests, which would suggest that that was either a mixed camp or that there was a separate section for women. Uh, we tried to confirm uh, the story. Uh, even Memorial was not able to do that. So. Uh, I, I don't really know. It is possible that the, it's a shoe of uh, it's poorly made to belong to someone in the position of authority. It might have been a made for or the camp commander, maybe. Uh, but it wasn't like the, the Nazi camps. So maids usually were not accompanying um, administration. Those places, jackets, uh, a little oil lamp. Uh, it's like an oil one. Trust me. <laughs> it's an oil one. Um, so these are, yes, these are the, 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 the objects are are the really scary thing, and and the uh, and what humanizes it uh, in a way that uh, I don't think that the Nazi concentration camps can, can uh, humanize the experience just because it's still standing, just because you can. See the you know the beds that they slept on, and they are left exactly as they were. They are not beautified or, or preserved in any way. Um, it might be a very controversial statement, but um, we all had that that feeling at this point. Um, but once we started hiking, once we started getting to the uh, to the camps, it wasn't all like sad and serious. 
because it's really hard to be sad and serious when it's like one girl and five guys and we're like hiking and we haven't showered in weeks and we sleep in a tent and we make a rule that before we go to sleep we undress outside because the moment one of us is up close it's just it makes others very nauseous. <laughs> so the rule was that we undress outside and then we come into the tent uh, after after that. Uh, in fact, in, in the very beginning when we met the Dima, uh, he looked at our tents and he was like, you don't need tents. You can sleep by the fire. Until it's like negative 15, you can sleep by the fire, no problem. Why would you carry tents? Leave the tents. We're like, no. We'll, we'll take the tents. Whatever you'll see, I'm sleeping by the fire. First night, we must have by the fire. We had two tents, one for three people, one for two. Because uh, we did not expect a guy to be accompanying us. Uh, so the first night, we must have in the tent. The second night, we all said good night, proceeded to the tent. A minute later, we can hear some commotion. <laughs> and we in the tent for three can hear Dima. <laughs> opening the other tent and pushing himself in <laughs> to sleep with the other two guys. So the idea of sleeping in the, um, without the tents was abandoned rather quickly. And um, the story of Ruslan, the most amazing part of the entire uh, trip, the bridge on Makovskaya River. This is a major river. This is like East River size-wise. And this is a major bridge that really weren't preserved, wasn't preserved too well. And as far as I was able to suck it up and you know go through with the previous ones, I saw this one and I was like, no, sorry guys, I'm not, I'm not crossing it. Like This is not going to happen. We're going to die. It's extremely dangerous. Uh, every, like I don't know, fourth uh, you know, wooden plank was there. And I was like, it's just crazy. So it's absolutely suicidal. So guys are like, oh, yeah, maybe she's right. I mean, it's, it is really dangerous. In the meantime, Dima is freaking out. I told you not to bring a woman. Why did you bring a woman? Everyone knew that a woman can also only be trouble. <laughs> so I'm like, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Uh, but I'm like Adam. I'm like, I'm sorry, but I'm not crossing this bridge. Um, and then we hear barking. And barking means dogs, and dogs means that there is a hunter somewhere around, and that there is a hunter who has a boat, and he can take us to the other side. So the man, the guys, uh, went to look for the hunter. I was left alone to tend the fire. Uh, and uh, they were like shooting the, uh, his rifle and yelling, and finally they, they found a hunter, Russo. Uh, when we explained to him why we need to like use his boat, he looked at me like, "This bridge is difficult," and he kept like crossing it back. And <laughs> 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 we were like completely insane, so he just kept walking back and forth. It was really scary, but um, Ruslan was uh, an interesting man, uh, 25 years old, living alone in the taiga in a little hut. Uh, hasn't seen people months, hasn't seen a woman, even longer, he's absolutely terrified of them. Absolutely terrified. <laughs> and also not really a talker, as we would ask him a question and then he would look into the distance and walk away. So <laughs> communication wasn't really going, but he had cigarettes. And it was as if like new light <clears throat> was poured into Dima. Cigarettes, it's fantastic. We have to go to your little hut and get those cigarettes. And while we're there, I mean, you have an oven, you can bake some bread, and it's going to be nice and warm. So Dima is like telling us this ridiculous story of how we are all going to go to Ruslan's place. And we're all going to stay in his hut, and it's going to be fantastic. And at that point, we're like, you know, we haven't slept in like in warmth in like days, weeks at that point. So we're like, sure, you know, that sounds that sounds interesting. So um, we make it to his boat. Uh, as it turns out, the boat has a very 
the number of major holes at the bottom. So we were each handed a bucket, and we had to like, really, really fast <laughs> remove the water so that we don't go down. And uh, this picture and the picture that is about to follow were taken within a two-minute span. And this is how weather changes in Sydney. <laughs> so, yeah, it was getting bad. So we make it to Ruslan's place. Uh, it turns out that, yeah, he has a hut that's like the size of this deep. Uh, maybe one person except him can sleep inside. We, and we don't have our tents with us. We don't have our backpacks with us. Because Pima told us to, let, to leave everything by the bridge. We're going to come back and get it in the morning. Now we're just going to sleep in the hut. So it turns out that, yeah, there is also a tent that Ruslan has, only this kind of floor. Sleeping on permafrost? Just don't do it. Just don't do it. Uh, so looking at the Dima, uh, immediately tells Ruslan that we have no flour, even though we have like a pound of flour. We have no flour. Can he give us some flour? And we're going to make some bread. Then he like steals his cigarettes and multiple, like, Birds that Ruslan killed previous days or previous days, and like some fish. It's just Dima's just like taking whatever he can, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and when we realize the situation, and it's like like freezing temperatures, like below freezing at this point, okay. And we're sitting around this like little fire, shaking and dreaming of our sweet little tents that are by the bridge. Uh, but at this point, it was dark and too late to to get back to them. And we said, Dima, so look, who's gonna who's gonna sleep in the hut? He's like, of course me, it's cold out here. <laughs> like, whatever. Yes, here you can, this is the hut, and this is the tent. In fact, what happened when we put up the tent, uh, because it didn't have no, uh, any flooring to it, uh, the tent was really just trapping the cold air coming up from permafrost. So it was actually colder in the tent than it was outside. Uh, in the morning, we... Uh, are shivering around the fire, just really like at that point we were like, we're just gonna get back to the bridge, we're gonna take the tents, we're just gonna set up camp right now, we're not hiking anymore, we're going to sleep because we spent the entire night like shivering at the um, outside of this tent. Um, at this point, the door to the little hut swing open, Dima gets out, wearing a t shirt because that's how warm it was inside, looks around and starts singing. Oh no! <laughs> it's really cold. It's really cold, and we're like, this is a really unfortunate joke. Uh, but yes, but we've met a, a real technician, a real uh, person who, and yeah, this, these are these are bird traps uh, that are set that he oh, that he sets up uh, to protect himself. Um, birds, um, rifles, his rifle, the newer one, Dima's rifle, the older one. That's when he was really like emotionally attached to his rifle, so Lukash <laughs> decided that that might be a conversation starter to talk about rifles. So he points to Ruslan's rifle and then to Dima's and said, Oh, Ruslan, these are good rifles. Like, which rifle would you rather have? And Ruslan goes, just walks away. <laughs> so, uh, but at the end, when we were heading back towards the bridge to pick up our stuff, I think that must have been the most beautiful day for Sun's life because we were the end. <laughs> it's, it's crazy, but when you think about it, if you live alone in a micro hut like this for years in the middle of a forest, and suddenly you have six people invading your place, including five foreigners and a woman. That's, that's that's a pretty that's a pretty hardcore that's a pretty hardcore thing to do. He he lives there during the summer with his uh, younger brother, but his younger brother at that point was already picked up by helicopter as in school in Krakow. So. And dogs, dogs are Hunter's best friends. Uh, unbelievable, super friendly. Uh, they know uh, that. They, they live in this symbiotic relationship with humans. Uh, and they know that their own survival depends on being with humans. So, uh, and they so rarely encounter you know, 
random people, that they are like, you know, immediately there on the ground to be pets, to, you know, to cuddle, they love that. Uh, but uh, also incredible hunters. Uh, we were supposed to bring a dog on our trip, Dima's dog, because Dima also has a hunting dog, a Laika. But um, the dog escaped like 15 minutes before the helicopter was about to take off, so like, Dima wasn't particularly well organized. <laughs> Um, and finally, it was time to head home. But getting home is not really that easy when you are hundreds of miles away from civilization in the middle of a forest. Um, what do you do? Well, when we went to Rukhans, we met a person. We're still not really sure what he does. Supposedly, he owns the local oil and gas industry. But he would just make things happen for us. Like, the um, we need to get back from the taiga. I happen to own boats that I can send to pick you up. And then at this point, this is like 300 miles up the river one way to get us out of where, from where we are right now. He sent a boat, the boat came, the boat picked us up. We couldn't afford a hotel in Turukhais. Hotel is really not a proper word to describe what it was, but a uh, building where people stay overnight. It's ridiculous. It was like 300 bucks a night, okay? <laughs> in a room for seven people. So, seriously, like New York, New York prices. Uh, he went to the lady at the reception desk and made this gesture. And prices changed. And then, so he was our, our hero here on the, on the boat, going back, playing cards. And at this point, it turns out that um, Selkups, the uh, native uh, tribe to which Dima uh, belongs, Selkups take their cards very seriously. And there is no cheating allowed. And by cheating, what is understood by cheating is it includes if you're not really sure about the rules and you make a mistake. That leads to uh, very violent outbursts. <laughs> he, at that point, he was threatening Marek, our cinematographer, that he's going to kill him. And then, um, then he said, he said at some point, "You're lucky I'm from Kharkov because if I were from Sovietska, you would." Be dead. <laughs> 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 and we were like, "Whoa." <laughs> Just playing cards. Just playing cards. I'm not going to get it. So yes, he was he was taking it very uh, very seriously. Mm. In the beginning, because the way it was all arranged was really like how Dima ended up going with us. I mean, we show up in a village of 300 people, and two days later we leave with one of the guys who leaves his family and everything for three weeks to like hide the tiger back and forth. Meanwhile, when that was happening, his wife is visiting his sister, her sister somewhere else, so she doesn't know that he's leaving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and he was like, ah, no, whatever. <laughs> She'll find out. Someone tell her when she gets here. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and Dima was like, I don't want any money from you. I don't want anything. Uh, because I'm doing it as a favor to my friend who asked me to help you guys. Okay, still, we were dropping him off. We gave him all the maps. We gave him gloves and like a ton of different equipment that we had. We bought him like a case of vodka. We bought him a case of uh, yogurts for his grandchildren because that's what he wanted. That's what he wants yogurts for his grandchildren. And then we gave him the equivalent of about $1,500, uh, which is really not that much up there because everything is insanely expensive. Everything is really expensive because it's so hard to get food or any goods to those remote locations. The transportation is so expensive that, the, you know, food is really expensive. Food is also, everything is uh, after the expiration date. Because the rule, general rule is that the Precious stuff is in Moscow. The less fresh stuff is in Krasnoyarsk, and then the further you go north, the the closer the you know the closer you approach the expiration date, and then by the time you reach a place like Turukhais, 
everything is past its due date. But there are two categories of products. One is the products that will be sold to anyone. The other one is the products that will be sold only to the natives, because if you're a foreigner, that's going to kill you, because that's how badly past due date it is. <laughs> so that was, that was an interesting uh, uh, experience. Um, two weeks after we got back from Siberia, we get a phone call and want you to make a phone call from Krakowa to make it all the way to Poland, where we were at the time. It's not that easy. You have to go through multiple channels. So a phone call. Can we get a phone call? It's Dima's wife, who is losing her mind because we took her husband away, because we took him away. He didn't have the chance to go hunting season, and we didn't make it. Well, we did pay him. So the whole conversation happens. It turns out that by the time the wife was back from visiting his sister, he not already spent everything on booze. So to he told her that we didn't pay him, so that he doesn't have to like, tell her that he actually spent everything that we paid him. So yes, and all the way to Poland. And on our way back, uh, we ran. The, the hunting season in the taiga is uh, in the winter. So this point in September, everyone is preparing for the hunting season. The hunters are leaving their villages and they're all heading into the Tiga where they spend the entire winter. Um, and uh, so while we were going on the boat back to Tulu Heinz, we saw tons of little boats taking hunters into the into the Tiga. One of them, Vladimir. Vladimir got so excited in us. And he was like, oh, you know, I have this amazing hut. You have to see it. Dragged us off our boat. Made us pretty much, because the captain of our boat was like, OK, have like 10 minutes. So made us sprint <laughs> up this like, major hill and went like, this is my hut. Let's go. And we're like, oh, it's fantastic. It was really worth running here. So we convinced him to at least take a picture of us. And then as we were uh, running back to our boat, he stopped and he said, but why are you here, really? Because by the time uh, we were coming back, everyone knew about us. In Farkovo, we were the first foreigners since 1954, when the camps were evacuated and the last uh, you know, prisoners left. They haven't seen. Like, so by the time they approached us, uh, when we were coming back, they knew our names. They knew where we were from, like everything. So <laughs> they don't get they don't get much many visitors. So he goes like, "So why are you here?" And Malik says, "Oh, we're making this uh, documentary about the camps." I said, "About the camps, but why?" And Malik says, "Well, we think it's very important that the suffering that the people." went through here, and this bloody history is remembered and uh, preserved for posterity. And everyone talks about the Nazis, but not many people talk about the Soviet camps. And Vladimir stopped and was silent for a while. And then he said, everyone else forgot about us. Thank you. And it was, you know, coming from such a you know, simple, hardcore man who, you know, Clearly knows his way around the rifle and you know the bottle. That was just really, really beautiful, and and it made this trip worth even more than it was. And that is us going back, coming back to war. So uh, it was the last time when uh, Alexander Sasha, the mysterious oil and gas resource owner, made his magic work. We were in Thuruheinz and we couldn't get a flight uh, to Krasnoyarsk or to Moscow. There were no tickets, everything was booked, there was no way to get out. And our visas were about to expire. Uh, and in America, when you're here and your visa expires, they just kick you out. Where in Russia, when your visa expires, you just stay forever. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's, not that, it's not that cool. Um, so we were getting really, really worried. We were like two days away uh, from the expiration date of our, from our thesis and mm, didn't get the flight. Well, Sasha made a number of phone calls 
and so then we were on a helicopter to Igarka, which is further north. Um, and then he said, someone will pick you up and things will happen. <laughs> someone did pick us up, actually, like, the moment the helicopter landed, and that's a major air airport in, in Igarka. The moment the helicopter landed, there was a guy right there in Ustransi. Okay. Foreigners follow me, right? Uh, so we did follow him. He put us up in the hotel, for which we did not pay. We didn't have any money left at that point. Um, and then he said, I'll come pick you up tomorrow at 8 o'clock in the morning. OK. So he picked us up. He took us to the ma main building of the airport. And uh, after a, a very convoluted but very brief conversation, he emerged from like a little room carrying five plane tickets to Krasnoyarsk. But those tickets were already sold to other people. And he went up to this lady, this like little table, and said, here are the tickets, here are the passports, change the names. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and she did, and she did. And um, she did, and um, <laughs> afterwards, he, he says to us, And we're like, okay, how much? 120 rubles. That's like three dollars, okay? And we're like, take her 500, seriously. <laughs> uh, so um, we are about to get on the plane to Krasnias, going through check in, and the guy online immediately <laughs> ahead of us gives his ticket and his passport. The lady looks at it and is like, no good. <laughs> the guy is like, and he's like, this ticket expired 20 minutes ago. <laughs> so he ended up, we don't know who the other people were, but he ended up staying. We ended up uh, boarding the plane, flying to Krasnoyarsk, and switching for a to Moscow. And we still have absolutely no idea who Sasha really is and how the whole thing happened. But, and that is a major flight that is in the international flight system. Like, you can book it through Expedia. That was that kind of flight, OK? And that's just, the tickets just would change. So, uh, so we made it back. And it was a, uh, and it was an absolutely fantastic experience. And uh, I think it's changed all of us. All of us agreed it was the most beautiful and unbelievable thing that ever happened to us. And, um, yeah, I think this is the kind of this is the kind of history that you will never learn in an archive or in a library, no matter how many days you spend there uh, and how thorough your research is. But sitting with those people who remember all that, whose parents were in those camps, uh, that's that's really eye opening and that completely changed what I thought I wanted to do with my life. Yes, yeah, so I talked a lot. Oh, jeez, I did. <laughs> I'm sorry, I talked like a lot. So uh, I'm going to stop talking right now. And well, of course, I think we should talk. If it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so, totally. If you, like, let's, let's do it like a laid back. That was amazing. That was amazing. Thank you. Oh. you really just lost. And was really um, even more incredible than I thought. Oh, really? Oh, I did, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, anything. I think any questions. Showering every day, totally overrated. Though. Yeah. <laughs> totally overrated. Mm -hmm. After two weeks, that's when you start to get itchy. Mm -hmm. And it's, we started to lose our sense of humor. We were looking at, so what's wrong? And I was like, it's itching. <laughs> <laughs> I think that itching and sense of humor are somehow directly related. So, um, at the camp, um, the ones that had them down. There weren't any documents, were there? Was there anything? <coughs> no, that was, what was really surprising is um, we expected that all the documents were evacuated with yeah. the people because that's a fairly easy thing to evacuate. Yeah. It's not like a train, right? Mm -hmm. But what was really surprising is that there were no plaques, no signs, no nothing, like not a single written word. It's as if uh, when evacuating, they put a specific emphasis on removing any like written material. Yeah. Um, 
we, fa we found one document in the laundry uh, place that uh, was uh, like a list of uh, names uh, and times next to it. I'm not sure uh, you couldn't figure out what it might have been because it was in the laundry room. We assumed that maybe it was the administration and uh, officers who were supposed to like, pick up their cleaning, uh, their dry cleaning, <laughs> their laundry. Uh, but um, we, we weren't really, we weren't really sure other than that. Where did the school children live, or who did they live with? Uh, they, they, there is a uh, dormitory where they where they all stay together. So uh, very standard. You know, this is what you would imagine a dormitory looks like. Uh, and they, they all live there together. The uh, it's only one school. Uh, it's very weird because uh, it's theoretically an elementary school, but practically the youngest kids are six. And the oldest are 18. Uh, and uh, they have only four teachers. So the kids are kind of lumped together in various configurations. Um, they have Russian classes. They have uh, math. Uh, they have earth sciences. And then they have a uh, class. It's really interesting. It's uh, called the history and culture of the Selkuk people. And this is specifically what, even though they are not all Selkuk, in fact, the minority of them are Selkuk, the majority of them are Evan and Ket. These are two other ethnic groups. Uh, but the history teacher is Selkuk, and he is very, very into preserving um, the uh, culture and history of, of his own people. So all kids, by proxy, take the history and, and culture of of the circle people, and um, not only that, they uh, th this is the class during which they learn about Stalin and about the camps. They learn about the camps from the perspective of how the existence of the camps influenced the circle people and their native way of life. And uh, we talk to those kids, like little eight-year-olds, and all of them know, yes, there were camps here, people died because Stalin sent them here, and Stalin fed. Everyone knows about it. We were really worried that people would, you know, be iffy about us researching such a such a topic because, you know, Stalinism. It's they still didn't fully grapple with that period of history, the Russians. So we, we were afraid of possible repercussions. But everyone is totally open about it and like really actually surprised that anyone would care rather than you know offended by. It. What's the next thing that you would like to do with the next step in your research? What to be done? With this project, uh, I'm uh, putting finishing touches on a major paper that focuses precisely on that, on how uh, the presence of the camps uh, influenced the uh, traditional way of life of the native people, and how they now uh, appropriate those camps and utilize them uh, in a way that you know, those hunters who go into the taiga for the winter, a lot of them stay in the camp buildings because this is, you know, readily available accommodation. And uh, they use, uh, in, in a society that has no maps, this is an easily navigable thoroughfare. So you can always locate yourself versus, you know, the train tracks. Uh, and, um, and they use it, in, you know, in those classrooms to, like, raise the uh, you know, national, national ethnic identity by uh, of the kids by like explaining their experience and their history through the, the interaction of the camps. So I'm, I'm doing that for them. Are there any other jobs that the kids do once they graduate from school other than hunting? Gathering. <laughs> what are the schools for camping? Yeah. And do they get any education at the outside world? Or just about their perspective? They have no access to the outside world, really. Uh, they have no TV. They have no phones. There is a telegraph in, uh, there is no internet. There is a telegraph in Farkovo, but, you know, telegraph is not really the most efficient way of communicating with the world uh, right now. So, um, and most of them, 
uh, they would just do what their parents are doing, which is hunt, trap, because this is not only hunting. Hunting and trapping are, there is a significant distinction. Hunting, you just kill something mainly for meat, whereas trapping, uh, you trap animals for fur, so you can't shoot it because that's going to damage the, the fur. So uh, like the, the, the main source of income is sables, uh, because sables are extremely expensive. Uh, and if they are ma managed to trap 50 sables during one winter, they're good for the year. This is like their income for the entire year. So those best ones that are like really, you know, they, they call them you know, uh, molodiets, like really like cool guys. Uh, they pride themselves on the fact that they can shoot a sable through an eye so that it's killed and it doesn't ruin the health. So that's, that's, that's pretty, I, I haven't seen it done, and I'm rather glad that I haven't. <laughs> but that's, that's, yeah, okay. so they hunt together. They got the berries, uh, boats come to Fargo and pick up berries and mushrooms and take them to uh, to Heinz and sell them there. So this is also what they do. Pine nuts, pine cones, they, they pick up those. Um, so the children educate you, they become literate to a certain point. They learn math, they learn some local history, but they're not expected to do anything with it just to have a Well, no one could afford to send. In fact, Dina's daughter is in Krasnoyarsk, and that's like a big deal. Mm -hmm. That she she goes to med school, uh, wow. she wants to be doctor. So she's in Krasnoyarsk going to med school, and that's considered like a big deal. Uh, because no one else makes it makes it up. Oh, they, they don't even want you. When we were in Yangon, talking to those meteorologists, uh, one of the questions that I would ask was like, "Would you like to travel? You know, if you had an opportunity, would you like to go see, I don't know, Paris or America or, or just you know anything?" They were like, "No. Why? Why not? What is there in Paris? We can't hunt. Fair enough. So if you could go somewhere, where would you go? Where, where would you like to go?" And the guy said, when I was in the army, I was in Murmansk, which is also way above the Arctic Circle, but in the European part of, of Russia. And that's where I would like to go. It's good climate. It's like negative 25 in the winter, plus 25 in the summer. And the herds of reindeers are so big, you can shoot them with a Kalashnikov. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so, so they really had no. Um, we really have no desire, really. You know, the, the, we were so we were like such a curiosity to them. I mean, there was no, I didn't sense that, and uh, that's why also they don't feel really deprived uh, as people would who can, you know, see the big world on TV and they know that they have no access to it or they can't make it because they can't afford it. They you don't get the sense of depravity. They're happy. They really are happy. They really are happy. And the very like. You know, basic way, but in a very like amazing way. Too. They have a huge drinking problem. <laughs> so it's the, it's the, it's the native people because they were uh, the ethnic Russians are fine. The ethnic Russians, in fact, in the, in the majority living they're far far north. The majority don't drink at all. Uh, but the ethnic people who were forced to leave the taiga and forced to resettle into those villages, they feel like their life was ruined. Uh, and uh, you know, we met a local witch, and uh, she was horrible. And we really wanted to talk to her because she seemed like a fascinating woman. But um, we were also recording that stuff, and we didn't want to show because she was drunk in such a way that it was like really degrading. So we didn't want to portray those people in such a way. So we tried to talk to her and say, "Listen, if you can like just sober up just a little bit." And we're going to do the interview, and like you're really interesting. She was like, I haven't been sober since I left, and I will only sober up if I have lost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's that. That was really really sad. But other than other than that, the, it's the most beautiful. Question. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> if the the animal rights movement were to be successful in making her coats, hers, uh, essay in the West. What would happen to the movies like this? Because the, those pelts are so uh, valuable. Um, they sell. Um, 
already the fur wearing in the West is the same to such an extent that the West is not really the market anymore. It, only to a very, very small extent. It's the Russians, they sell it to Moscow. And it's the it's you know it's the rich Russians who are who are first. That's their that's their main uh, main market. And to China. And uh, Russian, and then we picked up a number of words in the local languages, so we were incorporating those <laughs> as well. And um, they were so like really genuinely interested in you know the fact that we were there that we could pretty much make it, you know just universal international language or <laughs> you know gestures and. Everyone speaks Russian. Everyone speaks Russian. Absolutely, everyone speaks Russian. Yeah, because the, their own languages are so diverse. That if they live in a village of you know 300 people, the Kent language and the Selkuk language are like completely. So if they didn't speak Russian, they wouldn't be able to communicate among themselves. These people were displaced from the Tiger because of the Gulags. Uh, not only because of the camps were one of the one of the reasons, but mainly because. Uh, the Soviet authorities wanted to have more control over the population, and it's really hard to control the population if these are like, uh, you know, random TPs every, you know, 30 miles. How do you really control those people? So they were uh, forcibly moved. Uh, majority of them were forcibly moved. Now they are returning. This is the kids that are born in the Taika. This is the new wave of uh, them returning to the Taika and going back. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. It was so like home.